Tracy Swedlow, and this is Television Nation. I am very happy to welcome a favorite person, longtime TV vet, somebody who's been to TVT a million times, moderated panels, the great, the only, Patrick Donahue, who has his own company now called Next Stop Willoughby, which is, of course, from that uh, Time uh, Twilight Zone episode. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Tracy, good to see you, even if it is from halfway around the world, so thank you. Well, we could dig a hole, you know, underneath the earth. <laughs> no, yeah. okay, that's a better. All right, anyway, so I am I was really excited to uh, to welcome you to Television Nation because, you know, you're a, an active member of our community and have been for many, many years. Of course, um, you worked at Cablevision as their executive vice president. I can't remember the exact title of Cablevision. Uh, yeah. for all the work they did on interface development, but you've worked at, you know, many companies and contributed to the TV industry, the uh, interactive TV industry. You even used to do a column for us, right, on the history of interactive yeah. television. Right, because you've been in it almost as long as I have. I remember running into a, God, one of the trade shows many, many years ago when you first started ITVT, so yeah. And lots of titles, lots of job changes, but always interesting, cool projects, you know. Always, you know, the reason I think you and I always get to do stuff together is because I just love doing innovative, new, interesting things, pushing the envelope creatively and technically. So, like I say, it's been nice working with the community that you and I have worked with because we just always had this opportunity to be like right on the cutting edge of just wonderful stuff, right? Whatever. And Well, that describes you, Patrick, because you are always... Uh, innovating, you were always pushing for better quality, for um, you know people to do more with less, and uh, you know I just think that's really great that you you've, you've been a supporter of um, the medium, not just the community, but the medium moving forward as a as a you know something that uh, could be enjoyed by humanity, right? It means something to you. It's important to your heart, and I know that. So. Yeah, no, you know, just like you, I live and breathe it. I mean, I work on Emmy committees, both on the creative side and on the technical side, because I'm one of those sort of odd hybrids where I have uh, patents, but I also have Emmys and I design and I can code and so all that stuff. So I'm just sort of this odd mix of, you know, a little bit of skills, in a lot of different areas. And so it's really helped me in this kind of space, you know. I think you won one of our uh, all-star leadership awards, like the first one, one of the first ones I think it was back the, in the uh, old days. Yeah. In fact, I think it was me and Rick Mandler and Dale Herrigstad and Rupert Murdoch, if I remember right. It was Rupert Murdoch, and there was a guy from Scientific Atlanta who was involved with all their set-top box stuff. Okay. On to what you're doing now, because you've moved into the VR space. You've been working on this for quite a long time, and you have your own company now called Life Hutch VR. And just before you go into what all that is, I don't know if you're aware, but I was one of the first journalists to cover the emergence of VR in the early 90s. So I've been sort of tapped into that whole universe, uh, you know, as it's gone in this parabola, right? Yeah. Um, and watch the, you know, the early projects come out and the people and the new companies. So I'm, I, I don't think it's a surprise. It's not surprising to me that you would embrace VR because it's, you know, it's still on the bleeding edge and, uh, but the technology has improved so much. So I really am excited that you have launched a title right into the marketplace. It's selling. We want to yeah. hear about what that is. What yeah. is Life Hutch VR? Tell us all yeah. about it. And, and like you, I've been sort of just loving VR since those early days with uh, Jaron Lanier, I think his name was, right? The early mm -hmm. sort of genius. And every like five or six years, the technology would kind of pop up and we get excited and then go, eh, it's not quite ready, right? And so right. for me, when I, I was fortunate enough to be able to sort of exit the telecom space and, uh, and was like, okay, what do I do next? Um, and I think you may know this, but you know, I started life as a filmmaker. I went to film school. And so my background is in shooting, lighting, editing, all that stuff. And it's been one of my passions my whole life, right? So when you get to that point where, you know, you have this opportunity to pivot, as we say in corporate America, I was like, this is the time, right? I mean, you gotta like grab these opportunities and run with them. And so, you know, when I sort of reflected on what I'm into, I love storytelling, I love filmmaking, I love visual art. Um, 
and I also love technology and innovation. So for me, you know, that just happened to coincide with when VR was really kind of reemerging, right? With the Oculus headset, uh, Gear VR, Google Cardboard. And so it just kind of was like the timing was right. And I just thought, you know, I, I've always wanted to make a video game. I love visual storytelling and I love technology and it kind of just lined up perfectly. Um, and, and so, you know, for me, another thing you may know about me is I love immersive experiences and we're fortunate, like, uh, we get to do all kinds of crazy, wacky stuff. You know, we, we walk the streets of Chernobyl, we've driven tanks, we've gone to all kinds of immersive theater events like Sleep No More and uh, Secret Cinema. I wanted to see that. I wanted to see that because I studied, I studied uh, directing, I studied directing theater for many years and television and film. And I, um, we're not going into my history here, but I, I totally understand that interest in immersive theatrical experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been something we've been Space. following, you know, and experiencing because we're big theater goers. And it's there's such a visceral, wonderful experience when you truly are, you know, inside the, those experiences. And I would tell everyone who's watching and you look up Secret Cinema and the work they're doing in London because it's absolutely incredible. And we did a Blade Runner experience there a couple of years ago where you truly were walking inside the world of Blade Runner and experiencing the film. And Anyway, all those types of experiences just really tapped into, for me, this feeling of like, I love sci-fi as I know you do. And I, I just, I love that feeling of just truly immersing yourself, the way you lose yourself in a book or a good movie and, uh, and a good video game. And I just thought, how do you take that and kind of make it even like more personal, right? And so VR was a way to take all those sort of just my own personal, you know, interest and desire in those type of experiences and, and, and use it use VR to kind of help other people kind of do that, right? And and really feel like they've gone someplace and, and been part of something. And um, so with that, you know, it was kind of like, okay, so that's a that's a big idea, right? I want to immerse, truly immerse someone into this world that doesn't exist. Um, you know, one of my challenges was what, what you know? Um, you know with, what to do, what, yeah. what you wanted to create? Yeah, we're not a huge company, so we had to, you know, think about what was realistic from a budget perspective. You know, there are some technical constraints around VR, which means you can't quite do everything. Um, and so, you know, through a lot of, you know, sort of just head scratching and looking at lots of different properties, thinking about writing original properties, you know, I ultimately landed on this story written by Harlan Ellison, who, you know, I'm sure you know, very famous science fiction writer from well, he wrote the the most famous episode from Star Trek called right. The City on the Edge of Forever. Very good. I think the only one that won an Emmy, too, by the way. Yes. Co-starring. Um, uh, I can see her name uh, from. Joan. Uh, yeah. I can see her name with the dark hair. Yes, I know. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so no, he's, a, he's an amazing storyteller, you know, one of those sort of, you know, very sort of edgy, sort of, um, you know, out there sci-fi writers from that sort of period from say the 50s, you know, probably, I don't know when he stopped writing, maybe in the 70s. But anyway, he always wrote really sort of hard hitting, you know, social commentary sci-fi that really made you think. And, and there was a story in particular that I had read of his as a kid. Uh, in a magazine called Omni and it stuck with me all those years and so as I started thinking about VR and quite frankly one of the limitations of VR which is movement and walking around is really challenging in VR. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought you know this whole story or the majority of this story revolves around a guy who is trapped in a little tiny life hutch and can't move, can't walk and he has to figure out how to escape. And, uh, you know, kind of interesting timing with kind of what we're all living through right now. With, yes, it is so that. relevant. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Exactly. Didn't know that, you know, three years ago when we started the process. But, but truthfully, that for me, that was like, that was kind of that aha moment where I'm like, oh, it's a story about a guy trapped in a space and he's looking around and trying to solve problems and, and get out. And that was like perfect for VR in my mind. Um, so, you know, at that point, the story was written in 1956. Um, surprisingly relevant, but needed a little updating. And, and so, you know, I, I went uh, myself, uh, went about sort of adapting it for VR, adding some new plot devices and uh, some, some characters to kind of make it a story that, that would kind of fit and make sense. Um, and I want to see some, I want, I want to definitely see some visuals. It'd be All really right. great. Pull some up. <clears throat> 
And I also want to emphasize to everybody watching this that the title is for sale, right? And where can they find it? And I, I believe I saw a map somewhere that people were buying it all over the world already. Yeah. Uh, Very good. I appreciate that promotion. No problem. So you'll give us a link uh, we can put in here so people can uh, find it for themselves. And what equipment do they need, by the way? Yeah, now you can see the first image there. Yeah, what equipment do people need to be able to experience this? Yeah, so we built it for Oculus Rift and HTC Vive. Those are probably the two main headsets, well, two of the three main headsets that are out there. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have a desktop version because, you know, one of the things as a businessman, you know, the unfortunate reality for me is, is coming to grips with the fact that, um, you know, the, the market penetration of VR headsets is just not great. So your total install base is not giant. Uh, so, so we do have a desktop version. So if you don't have a headset, you can still experience it. Uh, right now that's available for Windows PCs. Uh, we have a Mac version coming out probably in a week or so. So um, if you buy it on Steam, you get the VR version, you get the desktop version, and then you can kind of watch it, you know, and, and experience it. It's better in VR, obviously, but it's still kind of, kind of cool. Is this a world you're exploring from that story or is this, is there a narrative or are you, I mean, are there timed incidents that happen? I mean, what is the structure? Cause you're, you know, yeah. you're, you're an expert in storytelling. So how did you structure this experience? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I wanted to be pretty faithful to the story because quite frankly, I love the story. And so the basic structure is, is relatively intact. As I say, I added some characters and clarifications and modernized a few things, but um, it is a linear story. So it has a beginning, middle and end. Uh, and it only has, well, it has, I guess, a couple of endings, but there's only one way to sort of finish the story. And, and so it was an interesting challenge because I'm a huge gamer and I play lots of, you know, games and I wanted some gameplay elements, but I wasn't not, I, I wanted it to ultimately be a, an immersive story more than a sort of shoot 'em up whatever kind of puzzle solving game. So, so it's really more about that story. And so, you know, you absolutely start in the life hutch and then you go through a series of scenes, uh, but the ending is, is basically always the same. Uh, so in that regard, it's more like a film uh, or a TV show than a video game. But along the way, you're shooting aliens and jumping and you know climbing through lava. And if you want, I can just show you a couple of the screens. Just yeah, later. absolutely. So this is some really conceptual art, and you know one of the things for me again, just being an artist and a designer for pretty much my entire adult life, I didn't make this particular image or most of these, but I, I had a, a really great team actually, mostly uh, located in the Ukraine, uh, with one artist here in the U.S. And, um, you know, as I would write the scenes and I would often do mock-ups and, and use lots of references, I would ask them to create these because I found these scenes were, were key to just kind of help ground everybody in, in the vision. Uh, so this happens to be like a sort of post-apocalyptic end of the world city where the aliens have destroyed uh, Earth, I believe. Kind of looks like Grenfell Towers actually in, in London a little bit. Yeah, it does actually. And this is a shot where we were figuring out the, the cockpit and, you know, I, I can nerd out a little bit on the art direction as I go through this, but I had a real very clear sense of the sort of the, the universe for this game. And, and it was basically about 200 years in the future. Uh, mankind has explored a number of planets when they suddenly find this alien race that they're basically in this sort of death, you know, throws with. And so my sort of direction to the team was, you know, it's technology that was probably, you know, 50, 60 years old. Mm -hmm that they've been constantly upgrading and adapting and, and, and modifying because, you know, they're in a fight to the, to the death and they just, they don't have the resources. They can't get upgraded. They can't yeah. get upgraded anytime soon. That's, yeah, yeah, I feel like I'm in that cockpit right there. Yeah, so the reason you have like the screens have different looking displays and the controls of different colors and it looks like things have been bolted on is because that was kind of the aesthetic we wanted was this sort of like, you know, sort of makeshift, you know, kind of world. Uh, this is kind of a key sort of, mm. you know, moment when when you you would be the guy in the spacesuit captain terrence when he finds this life hutch which is like he's got to get there to survive and uh if you notice just next to the life hutch there's this little silhouette of this robot who's a sort of a very key character in the in the film is it kind of like um it's a little little bit like uh uh the illustrated man when they go into the sundown you know, yeah. in the middle yeah, of that yeah. range, that rain jungle a little bit. 
You know, an interesting thing, like you're saying, Illustrated Man, this story is actually one of probably 10 or 12 stories that all take place in this universe that Harlan Ellison created. And there's some really just wonderful, some of them are three pages long, they're very short, some are a little longer, but, uh, you know, a lot of them were written during the Vietnam era. And there's a couple in particular that are very um, not so subtle commentary on war and, and specifically the Vietnam War. And, uh, this story, not so much, but some of the others definitely have a much uh, stronger political perspective. Um, and I actually would Great. love to produce more of these because I just found the content to be so powerful. Did uh, you have to pay the Ellison family a licensing fee or anything? Or how does yeah, that work? Of course. No, look, I mean, it's, a, it's actually, I think it's an interesting story. So, you know, at, at the time I wanted to do this, I'm going to say Harlan Ellison was in his mid to late 70s. Uh, you can play some more visuals while you're telling that. Oh, good. You so, more? yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll show you just some of the other shots of things that are going on. And uh, so you can see just here's kind of a lot of the art direction and, you know, conceptual work that we did as we sort of created what the aliens looked like and what the spacesuits looked like, all in that sort of world that, that we talked about. Um, Beautiful. These are some of the actual screens from the game. Uh, so, so the, the story on, on, on Harlan is, uh, you know, thankfully for my career, I've done tons of contracts, worked with lots of lawyers, but I've never done this type of a, you know, sort of a very traditional sort of option agreement for a story. So long story short, I'm like, how do I find this guy's agent? So I do like you always do, right? I search on the internet and ultimately found this guy who represents Harlan Allison. Uh, I want to say his name was Marty. Uh, very old, you know, sort of uh, very traditional LA entertainment attorney kind of guy. Was super awesome. Mm -hmm. Called him, talked to him. He had no idea how to write an agreement for this type of thing. So effectively, I wrote my own, you know, sort of terms for the options. Uh, and <laughs> did a Great. Deal. And, uh, but, but I guess the, you know, the unfortunate thing is, is both uh, Marty and Harlan both passed away towards the end oh. of this process. So I was really hoping to share it with both of them because they were awesome. I never actually got to meet Harlan, obviously, but I do have a signature on a contract. Um, but I was really looking forward to That's showing cool. Them. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, I was really looking forward to showing him the work because I'm really proud of it. And I, I'd like to think he would enjoy it and be impressed with it. So it was kind of one of my dreams that I would you know, drag it out to California and show it to him. But uh, sadly, that did not happen. But, Joan uh, Collins, by the way, just like, by the way, Joan Collins. Joan Collins, thank you. Star Trek. Oh. <laughs> I had to find that out. Okay. okay. Well, Look know. at these. Yeah. yeah that's, that's Ellis, by the way. Uh, so he's kind of a crucial character and he's just like robot and he's sort of very much, you know, inspired by a long history of droids like R2-D2 and uh, uh, gosh, the, even the, the, dro is it the drones, I think, from uh, Silent Running. So lots of really cool inspiration, even uh, uh, the robot from the Lost in Space movie, believe it or not. And he's a very pivotal character. And, and we spent a lot of time designing him in a way that he could be this very functional, sort of non-threatening little you know, worker droid. And then he suddenly can sort of transform into this menacing, very scary uh, you know, sort of robot. And that was, a, again, a lot of cycles with the designers to figure out how we take a robot and sort of have him have two very almost like a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing happen and, and manifest that visually. So again, he's a very sort of- Well, the, sh the shield is, I can see that it could be friendly or menacing. I mean, what is that shield for at the top? Yeah, the so I don't think I have any other images here with me, but what happens is he's got this little dome and when he's just driving around being a little maintenance droid, you know, picking things up and moving things, it's kind of collapsed and just like a little shell. And then as we were doing the sort of visualization and, and the conceptualization, you know, one of the ideas we had is that it, it's almost like a cobra where when it raises up, it, it um, what do you call that? The, Fans uh, out. Yeah, Fans out. Like I uh -huh. And so as we were doing a lot of the early work, we, we thought, you know, that's a way to take him from being this little robot to this big robot. So uh, you see he's got this like center sort of piston there that he actually shrinks down and becomes very small. And then suddenly he'll raise up and that hood opens up into this, like, almost like, a, yeah. A, a, it looks like it, like a Cobra. It looks like you could build that. It looks like a robotics expert. I mean, it looks plausible. Yeah. No? Yeah, great. Yeah, I was going to try to build one for Comic-Con, actually, because I thought it'd be fun to drive it around the, the floor. It'd be a good way to market the game. But, uh, uh, you know, no Comic-Con this year, so. 
All right. And that didn't happen. So that's a kind of a cross section of all the types of imagery that, you know, are in the game and screenshots and conceptual art and, and that sort of thing. So, so that, that was kind so of how, the process. How is it selling? Tell us a little bit like who, like who is buying this stuff? Can you no, tell? I don't know who's buying it? That's a good question. Uh, and I, I know where, which is interesting. And I think you saw the map I posted a week or so ago. It's kind of fascinating to see people are buying literally around the world, uh, even the places I didn't know exist. There's some little island off the coast of Africa called Reunion. Yeah. I mean, there was a discussion about that. It's Reunion. Yeah, exactly. Saw you yeah. saw that, right? <laughs> I don't know what the hell it is. I never heard of it. But they bought a copy of the game, so that's cool. Uh, a lot in Eastern Europe that may be uh, because, you know, a lot of my developers are Russian and Ukrainian, but Abu Dhabi, all over the U.S. So it's, it's, it's kind of cool in the sense that, you know, in this world that we live in now, uh, it's, it's a, truly a, a worldwide thing. And, and again, you know, you and I have been doing this for a long time. I mean, I published a game myself, like, you know, and I had a lot of technical help, but when it came time to push the trigger on Steam, you know, I launched the game sitting there in my house at midnight one night, and it's kind of empowering, and it's kind of an amazing story to see how individuals and indie developers using mostly free tools can actually truly launch a title around the world. So uh, for me, that was like, you know, you understand that intellectually, but then when you actually do it for real, it's kind of like, whoa, that's... Amazing. I mean, I know you've been doing this for several years. You've been developing this and yeah. you stuck with it and you, uh, you know, you gathered a team from, you know, people from all over the world and yeah. now you've committed, you've launched it. It's working. I mean, uh, the commitment, uh, the commitment you made was formidable and the, yeah. the, the discipline to stick with it. Um, I'm not shocked to see because I know that's who you are. I know that's who you are, You, like I said earlier. But what's interesting to me, though, is that you are also facing a market, right, that is still emerging. There's yeah. still a lot of work going on. There's a lot of, you know, but in this strange economic environment that we're in uh, with the pandemic and everything, what do you think? Do you think and because I see people using the word virtual reality as potentially for, you know, conferences, um, or maybe they'll, uh, you know, shoot, they'll give people experiences about, you um, exploring mountains or this kind of, I mean, what's the market like for you now? Is this, would you say that the world is ready for this, that they're going to embrace this, um, that the VR has a chance because of the, in, the pre high pressured environment that we're in for more experiences? I mean, what's your... Yeah, yeah, I mean, VR is incredible. And what it does is truly like, when it's done really well, it's, it's, it's like, you can't compare it to anything. Uh, you know, there's been very few, in my opinion, sort of breakout titles like that just blow you away. Uh, I think probably Beat Saber is the one everyone knows, which is amazing and it's really cool. And you find yourself, I don't know if you're familiar with it, you basically, it's a rhythm game. So you've got basically lightsabers and these shapes are coming at you and you have to hit them. And it's a, it's a rhythm sort of music game, super fun. And that's like by far probably the, the biggest selling game in VR. Um, my friend Bob let me do the uh, Star Trek experience. Of course, uh, I like Star Trek. And they like, you know, we put the head mounted display on and it was like, vroom, right? And then you're sitting at a table and you can talk with other people. It's networked. Does this network, by the way? Uh, no, no, strictly single player. Uh, so, uh, but it, that one's networked. So you can, you know, collaboratively drive a ship. Right? Yeah, an cool. enterprise or, or a different ship that you want but you know i mean it's still few and far between uh i'm just kind of curious do you think the market uh might see some growth uh, what are you what kind of chatter are you hearing about yeah i mean you know i don't know that there's a lot of sales numbers out there because you know when i was doing the roi in this project and i was kind of projecting sales you know it's really tough because they don't release a lot of those numbers uh playstation vr is by far the probably the most widely distributed headset uh, at least it was last time I checked. Uh, and that's probably because you don't need a $2,000 computer to attach to it. You can just hook it up to your PS4. Um, Do you know so, what the installed base is for uh, PS4? Oh gosh, I, I should, but I don't off the top of my head. It's significant. And, and the number of headsets is pretty significant. Uh, you know, I guess personally what I would say is it's, it's really expensive and that's been a huge barrier of entry. I mean, to build a VR system with a headset, you're probably in three grand to do it right and do it pretty much right. Um, you know, I think where that started to change is the Oculus Quest headset, which they released about a year ago. It's actually a mm -hmm. really good headset, doesn't require a PC, and they're actually doing some really innovative stuff where 
if you're familiar with VR, I should have brought some controllers. You have to hold these controller things, right? Yeah. And, uh, but with the Quest headset, they've actually done software where it will see your hands and it will map sort of 3D objects onto them. So they're, they started beta testing that. So no computer, no controllers. You literally put on your headset and you're in VR. So that's, to me, that re removes many of those barriers. It's not cheap, but it's a lot cheaper than a big fancy gaming computer and a headset. Um, so I think the Quest is probably the one that will probably change the world in that regard. Um, you know, the other barrier for entry is just, you got to put this thing on and people have to be okay with that. Um, but, but, you know, the payoff in my, in my mind is there. And, and I think you make a good point, right? I mean, I think right now we all are, you know, doing Zooms and doing things like this all the time. And there's some interesting software out there that allows people to do virtual world type interactions. So, you know, I, I think this could be kind of the breakout moment for that. Uh, actually, Facebook itself is launching a whole sort of, uh, sort of second life type experience, but you know, yeah, yeah. fast forward 12 years later, you know, with good technology and, and headsets that could be potentially pretty cool. Um, but is that going to be, I can't remember the release on that. Was that going to be like 3D and a 2D world? I mean, there's a bunch of those little apps out there right now where you can, yeah. you know, like the old world's Inc. Remember that? Yeah. You know, or second life where you could wander around, watch it, but you're moving in 3D. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think people are exploring, you know, VR. So um, for more than storytelling. Uh, sure. uh, industrial just, applications are huge. I mean, I've been talking to a lot of potential clients around doing industrial sort of enterprise stuff. You know, for me as a, as a you know, content, you know, sort of guy. I'm more I know you don't want to go down that route. I know you don't. I know you want to tell I, stories. I pay the bills, right? I've done plenty. But of yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. Trust me. It, if, if they have the right check, if they have a check, you know, if they've got a check for you, got it. then See, you know. you'll, you'll do it. Okay, no, I hear you. From, from training perspective, from, uh, you know, distance learning, I mean, there's some incredible simulators. In fact, I was doing a white paper for somebody. There's a surgery simulator where they actually allow you to, you know, go in and uh, uh, cut into someone's knee and do this, you know, knee replacement surgery. And there's actually some data which says people are learning better, faster, cheaper. And actually, by the time they get into the operating, they're more successful because they're doing this VR training. So there's a lot of that stuff. There's huge ROI. You know, heavy equipment operators, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening there where you can. You know, I could be training to run a, an excavator, you know, sitting here in, in my house, which, you know, in my case, I already know how to run an excavator, which is a lot more fun probably than VR, but. I know you like big equipment. You like big <laughs> tanks. Yeah, I do. Abandoned, abandoned warehouses, yeah, big industrial. Together would be nice, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah. do, you, do you think this could uh, transform into a, a more a photography version um, I mean, I know, for example, Brian, right, Seth Hurst, he has explored uh, 180 degrees and other things in VR, where it's more like a visual, like a, like a film experience, yeah. but it's, um, it's a different experience altogether. What do you think about the, the difference? Between yeah, you know, I mean, like, you know, like I told you, I, I was a filmmaker for many years. I still shoot a lot. I've probably had three or four 360 cameras. Uh, I think currently I'm using a GoPro Fusion and, you know, I'm really intrigued with 360 video and 360 film. I find I don't do it as much as I thought I would. Um, and I'm not sure why. I mean, part of it's just the practical reality of when you're shooting, you see everything, tripods, lights, crew, whatever. So it's very challenging. So it just fundamentally changes the way in which you would think about filming something for like a documentary type situation. I think it makes sense. Uh, I don't know that I've seen a, I've seen a lot of great examples of that for um, you know, sort of dramatic type things. Um, you know, also it's interesting to reprogram your brain as a filmmaker, right? You know, I'm gonna to cut to a close up of you and then I'm gonna cut away to, you know, something else and I'm gonna then wanna do a wide shot, right? And, and in 360, you don't do that, right? So it's, it's, it's interesting and it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a new world, just like every other sort of innovation, people are still figuring out how do you guide the viewer to look at certain things through sound, whatever. Um, you know, in that regard, I think it's actually more like immersive theater, like a Sleep No More, or like a Disney park experience, right? I mean, those guys are geniuses at getting you to look at the right thing at the right time, have the right experience. And 
and there's a certain skill set to that, which is actually more like a theme park designer than it is a filmmaker. So I think it's pretty cool. Um, you know, again, I, when I went to Chernobyl a couple of years ago, I shot tons of 360 because, I mean, you're probably never going to get back there. And it's such an incredible experience. And everywhere you look is just unbelievable that, you know, you just have I can't to believe you went there. Wow, that's yeah. a... It was that, that really fascinating place and it was a really interesting experience perfect use for 360 you know because again who most people don't get to go there um but you know you can put on a headset or whatever and look at the 360 that i captured there and really just get a sense of just what an incredible sort of snapshot of in history that that that, that place is so, uh, so what, what, i mean I'm, I'm sure there'd be actually interesting historical footage um that somebody could use not everybody goes there for sure. And it's it's changing every day. So it's one of those things that, you know, it, it, I could go on about Chernobyl for hours. It was one of the most fascinating places I've ever been. Um, but yeah, it sort of captures this very odd so time capsule of 1970s Soviet Russia uh, and, and what it would have looked like because it just stopped one day and it just, there it is, right? So it's interesting. It's going to be like a um, the lost city of El Dorado or something, right? Yeah. But all yeah. the all the grass is going to grow on top of it and to yeah, disappear yeah, exactly. in the jungle or the, whatever yeah. that landscape. I mean, I would love to do a VR experience in something like that and use volumetric capture and have people be able to truly explore it, whether it's in a story situation or more documentary situation. I mean, I do think, you know, if you think about the HBO or Chernobyl show, right? I mean, that was pretty gripping. Uh, and if you could even then immerse somebody into that using this kind of technology, uh, pretty, pretty amazing. Um, I guess, you know, actually, that's another thing like volumetric capture is, is probably a new sort of frontier. and you know, we've seen some really cool companies doing things where guys are on a stage where it's basically a green screen, 360 degrees, and they're actually capturing animated models of these people. And so, you know, you're capturing a performance of somebody and then it's being converted into a model that you could then interact with in 3D space. So there's kind of this convergence of technologies which could lead to some really interesting things. I've, I've always thought that at some point they would set up studios somewhere where you could go pay to have your likeness captured yeah. and retain be retained forever I, was, I know these celebrities are doing it and i know they did it for tupac shakur and you know whoever else but uh, uh whitney houston i think they were doing some kind of holograph yeah performance for her but i mean um so what is next for uh next stop willoughby are you going to pursue volumetric vr um experiences or make more of these harlan ellison short stories or what's your What's your, uh, what are your plans? You know, I mean, for me, like, you know, it's always nice to be able to step back. So now that we've launched and I'm feeling like that wonderful feeling of completion, which, you know, is so nice when you get it and you have a minute to reflect on like, what was, what did I learn? What did I enjoy? What did I need to improve on? I mean, I just love the creative process. And again, I just tapped into all these thoughts and, and dreams I've had over the years of being a filmmaker and a storyteller. And, and, and so, Love the technology, love what the enabling sort of that, that all these technologies like the game engine technologies, which are so incredibly robust and free by the way, which is remarkable. Um, but, you know, I think my big takeaway is I love that creative process, the design process, the, the, the design in the sense of creation, not just in visual design. And so for me, VR is awesome. I think there's some really wonderful things about VR. I would very happily do another VR project, but I'm also interested in AR technology. Uh, you know, so I'm pretty flexible. I mean, you know, I just think there's so much wonderful storytelling to be done and using technology to tell great stories. I mean, you know, I don't know that we've seen like the perfect AR application yet. You know, I don't know if you have like a favorite. I think everyone wants it to be amazing and I don't know that anyone has really sort of like nailed that yet. So I don't know what the killer app is, you know, for augmented. Um, you know, unfortunately with Magic Leap kind of taking severe cuts, it's not sure what the sort of long-term future is. But, you know, have you seen an AR thing that really blows you away that, you know, makes you want to do more? Um, I saw a project the other day that, um, it wasn't about storytelling necessarily, but it it would it would take almost like a photo of an object, and then it translated that object into an image in a sort of VR experience, and then you could paste it onto, on into your computer. 
I saw that too. Yeah, that was. You really saw it? Cool. Yeah, that was that was just sort of a technology. So I mean, you could you could create a storytelling experience using that. You can create like a a clue game or you know a treasure hunt or something. I mean, it seemed like there was a lot of opportunities to use that technology, but that wasn't. That's just something I saw just recently. Yeah, I think we all. We must have come through our LinkedIn feeds or Facebook yeah, feeds or something. I don't know where we saw that. I just follow whatever you're looking at. So, okay. <laughs> so you know, we've been you, you know, too. For, various, for various clients and things when we're consulting. You know, we're, in, we're often asked about you know augmented reality and you know at this point you know I think we see it more as something you could do some really interesting marketing stunts with uh, because you can you know obviously augment reality. So there's some interesting ways to put content in your world and allow people to share it and interact with it. And, and so for me, that's the type of stuff I'm seeing that I think is really compelling and really powerful. Uh, but it's, you know, it's such an emerging space. And, you know, if you see some of the Instagram filters people use where they, uh, you know, attach various things to their heads, I mean, super creative and right. Oh, well, my daughter is constantly saying, mom, look at this. Right. You know, she's always showing you. So maybe I'll see something super exciting that she shows me. Okay, yeah. um, I think we've uh, we've come to a, a good place to stop because there's so much more to explore another time. Um, maybe we should do a roundup of um, some of our favorite projects or technologies for um, augmented reality or VR. We could get like a little group together. Wouldn't that yeah, be interesting? Brian, a bunch of others, you know, we'll get a whole group together, that'd be fun. All right, that sounds good. I'll, I'll actually work on that. So thank, thank you so you much, Patrick. Patrick. By the way, you're you're doing a what? great service to the industry, and I think everyone's so happy to see you creating these videos and, and keeping mm. all this energy out there so that we can continue to kind of do what we do, which is kind of push the industry forward and, and do it in a really nice collaborative way. So I'm happy that you're doing these, and, and I'm really happy that you uh, want to make me part of it. So thank you. Thank you. You know how I feel about you. I already <laughs> said. All okay. right. Um, What's your URL so everybody can go and purchase? Oh, you know what? I'll even do you one better. So we'll play a video and you can get like a several minute view of the, of the video. Okay. That sounds good. Um, well, we'll post your URL here at the bottom as well at the same time, right? Yep. And, and, and the uh, URL will be oh. lifehutchvr.com. If people okay. want images, look at our process and look where they can buy it, then that would be awesome. If they want to reach out to you, just um, they can go to that site and find your email address and so on and so Absolutely. forth. All right. Uh, it would be a good idea if anyone's watching this, I, I know you are, but to contact Patrick because he really is truly uh, an award-winning creator and everybody loves him and respects him and his work. So uh, you, you would do well to collaborate with him. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tracy. All right, everybody, I'm Tracy Swedlow, and this is Television Nation. Thank you very much, Patrick. Stay healthy.